Hi guys, this is Katrin from Research and Conversations about Bipolar Disorder. If you missed last night's presentation, here's a shortened version of the recording. Um, you can also DM me with your email address and I'll send you the full recording. Thank you. Systems. We should attempt primary prophylaxis at those, and those are at highest risk. And in particular, if somebody has prodromal symptoms, anxiety, depression, uh, subthreshold bipolar, we should treat those. And we should treat continuously and preventive after the first major manic episode. And I'll show you the data for that in a minute. The key is preventing illness recurrence and progression. The other thing we have to do more of is treat anxiety and substance abuse comorbidity. And I'll show you a few things to do there. And contrary to most textbooks, instead of using monotherapy, we need to use complex, intensive, multimodal treatment uh, for the most difficult to treat patients. That way you get more medicines with different mechanisms of action that work better and actually give you fewer side effects. So that's the main theme here. So very high risk children because of parental or grandparental illness should start right off in the beginning, even before they have any symptoms with a good diet, exercise regimen, education of the family about watching out for illness developing, developing coping strategies so that this can help ward off depression. Mindfulness training is very helpful for the anxious kids. And if you mood, <coughs> mood chart, you can see when the illness starts to become more problematic and need more major treatment. And family-focused therapy uh, is crucial. <clears throat> and taking somebody with prodromal symptoms into a much better outcome. There's tons of studies that I'll show you on this. So family-focused therapy or any other kind of related family therapy is crucial for the kids at high risk. And then overall view of this is try for primary prevention. That is all these things before any symptoms arrive. You use things that don't have any risk. Try for secondary prevention after somebody has some prodromal symptoms. Definitely add some psychotherapy, family work. This N-acetylcysteine is a good thing. Omega-3 fatty acids. Possibly even minocycline for those who have inflammatory cytokine increases. And then when somebody has more full-blown illness, we get into tertiary prevention after the first episode. We want to prevent recurrences. And we do that with lithium, valparate, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, atypical antipsychotics, and their combinations. So this is a schematic then. Across the top are the stages of vulnerability, pre-symptomatic, prodrum. So we're talking about some primary prevention, but definitely secondary prevention. If somebody has ADHD, anxiety, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, that needs to be treated. And certainly when there's the first episode, there's a syndrome we need to treat that. Too often we wait until somebody has lots of episodes and that ends up in a high instance of treatment resistance. So we needed to do earlier treatment to get better long-term outcomes. One thing that parents can do if their kids are at high risk because parents have either depression or bipolar illness, <laughs> They can rate their kids age two to 12 on the kids' anxiety, depression, ADHD, oppositional behavior on a weekly basis. We'll send them, we'll send you or them a, uh, a rating system every Sunday night. And you can get into this 
by, by going to our bipolar news.org and clicking on childhood network and that'll get you uh into the child network and we can send you these these ratings and the key thing with these ratings are look at this so many of the kids that are rated by parents have lots of symptoms despite a ton of treatment so these are not being treated well enough you see mania depression adhd anxiety big time in this kid and this helps parents and physicians know that the regimen needs to be changed to make it more effective so the if if you do this child network ratings you can print them out and bring it to your doc and that will help ensure better approaches and novel approaches to the treatment so the new med message is treat intensively and continuously after a first mania why do we say that because in number one casting randomized people to two years of expert specialty clinic treatment offering education psychotherapy drug treatment mood monitoring and when he did that compared to treatment as usual in Denmark, which is usually very good treatment, the expert specialty clinic patients not only did better over the first two years, but then when everybody went back to regular treatment, they still did better over the next six years. I'll show you the graph of that in a minute. And here's the key thing, that after somebody has a first manic episode, their cognition goes south a bit. And it usually recovers over the next year, but only if there are no further episodes. So you really want to have no more episodes after that first mania. And we always need to think more about lithium because lithium, if you randomize to lithium versus quetiapine after a first mania, everything is better. Okay, so here's... Here's the data in blue. If somebody's in a mood disorder clinic with specialty treatment, not only do they do better in the, in the first two years, but then the next four years, when everybody goes back to standard care, they continue to do better. So people learn how to manage their illness better. So that's the name of the game. Is early comprehensive intervention and patient education will lessen the severity of the long-term course of bipolar disorder. So that's key. And patients need to press their physicians for intensive treatment right from the get-go because they may know more about this sometimes than some of the docs. A family history can help in the choice of mood stabilizers. Lithium works best in those with a positive family history of bipolar illness. And especially if a parent or relative was lithium responsive, then the offspring tend to be lithium responsive. Lithium tends to work best in classic bipolar illness with euphoric mania and distinct episodes and no comorbidity. Carbamazepine also called Tegretol, is best for negative family history of bipolar disorder. And it works well for people who have more rapid cycling, um, less classic bipolar illness, more anxiety and substance abuse comorbidity. And Lamotrigine is interesting because it works best in those with a personal family history of anxiety disorders. And the atypical antipsychotics work best for those with a family history of non-response to lithium. So we have a few things to help us choose among the major mood stabilizers here. And a new atypical antipsychotic has now come along that's actually the first one approved for kids aged 10 to 17, lorazidone or Latuda. Low doses, well tolerated, uh, few side effects, and 
it even has this funny thing on the bottom that in both the adult studies and in the kids studies with bipolar depression, those who have evidence of inflammation at baseline, higher baseline C-reactive protein, they actually do even better, which is highly unusual because usually if you have inflammation, it's tougher to treat. And then here's the thing that's not well recognized or pro practiced. The data are very impressive that combinations are more effective than monotherapy and bipolar disorder prophylaxis. And this goes with virtually everything, lithium and all other things. Even valproate with lamotrigine is better than valproate alone. All of the atypicals, if they're added on to lithium or valproate, work better. Uh, quetiapine plus lamotrigine works better. So. If somebody's not doing well enough, you know, ask for additional treatment. Even if you have a partial response, what you're trying to do is get a full response and get into remission. And this very often requires complex combination treatment. And then here's a few things that you can actually uh, do for yourself. The top two you can buy in a health food store, N-acetylcysteine, is good for all kinds of addictions, cocaine, alcohol, gambling addiction, smoking, marijuana, obsessive compulsive disorder, and it helps treat depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder. So N-acetylcysteine, they're 500 milligram capsules. You take one in the morning, one at night for one week, and then two in the morning, two at night thereafter. That can really help depression and anxiety and all these bad habits. The other top one is acetyl L-carnitine. This has antidepressant effects and it turns out that people with early onset depression have low levels of this substance in their blood and that, that leads to too much glutamate in the synapse that gives you fast firing neurons and it makes you vulnerable to depression and anxiety. Acetyl L carnitine turns on an inhibitory re receptor, decreases glutamate, and it also has a bunch of positive effects on pain and insulin and blood pressure. The other ones, gabapentin, topiramate, zanisamide, and modafinil are interesting because they're not anti-manic substances, sub, substances like valproate is, but they have good effects in say gabapentin, anxiety, social phobia, alcohol, and pain syndromes. And then topiramate, same thing. It's not anti-manic, but as an add-on to other things that are anti-manic, it can help with alcohol, cocaine, bulimia, anger attacks, and migraine. Zanisamide for alcohol and bulimia. Modafinil can help increase antidepressant responses in bipolar patients without increasing uh, the risk of switching into mania. And it also has pretty good effects in ADHD. So there's lots of these other things to think about adding in to try to get a more complete remission. And then as I mentioned, family-focused therapy for patients with bipolar disorder, ten, more than 10 studies, 1,000 patients. And if you look at the yellow stuff in the bottom, those with family-focused therapy did better in terms of depression, risk of recurrence, and they're functioning. So these very high risk kids who begin to get a little symptomatic, they should receive family focused therapy or its equivalents to get off to a good start. And this is also something that one needs to ask for sometimes. It may not be offered. Okay, so 
We've got a new set of principles here. Start prophylactic treatment after the first mania. I showed the reasons why that A and B, actually B, the, the thing is really important that cognitive defects improve after the first mania only if there are no further episodes. And we also know that the more episodes one has, the more cognitive dysfunction in general occurs. We also need to treat the comorbidities and residual mood symptoms to remission. Bipolar has tons of comorbidities and they need to be dealt with. And we need to teach patients and families about the illness and about using more lithium and the need for long-term prophylaxis, adjunctive psychotherapy, figure out what you're gonna do if things start going in the wrong direction, talking to a doc, develop a plan for crisis intervention if needed, and maintain full dose prophylaxis, because if you start to withdraw doses, that can lead to earlier relapse. So the last slide here, in conclusion, start continuous comprehensive treatment, use mood stabilizers for kids and adults. Treatment may require complex multimodal combination therapy. And against what people believe, if you use more medicines given carefully, you can have actually fewer side effects and they work better. Antidepressants don't work very well in bipolar disorder. They're good for unipolar and prevention, but not that many patients respond well to antidepressants in the long term with bipolar. Lithium should use, be used more often. It has all kinds of good assets. It increases the volume of one's hippocampus. It helps protect memory. And it even lengthens out people's telomeres, the end strands of the DNA that make you more vulnerable to illness, medical and psychiatric. So lithium's got all kinds of assets. And I would suggest using lithium at any dose that it's not associated with side effects. So the treatment of resistance and cognitive dysfunction increases the number of prior episodes. So the mantra is prevent episodes, protect the person, the brain, and the body. So that's the end of this quick overview, but it gives you kind of a philosophy of how we approach this illness, trying to do it earlier and better to get better long-term results. So with that, maybe we can open it up for questions that people might have. I have a quick question, Dr. Post. Could you explain the sensitization and kindling theory? Yeah. The sensitization phenomena is that when you have a stressor or an episode of cocaine use, the next time you have it, the effects are actually magnified. You don't get tolerant, you get sensitized to it, increased reactivity. Same thing with episodes. The more episodes you have, the faster they come. So that's the sensitization effect. And the kindling model is that if you have enough episodes that are triggered by stressors or substance abuse or other things, then they can start to happen on their own. If you kindle an animal with electrical stimulation of its temporal lobes, it, nothing happens in the beginning, but if you keep on doing that enough, it has a full-blown seizure. And then if it has enough of those seizures, they start happening without any trigger at all. So we think that what we're trying to do is avoid a kindling-like process in this illness and preventing too many episodes before they go on automatic. 
I have a question. Yeah, please. First of all, how do the, the stats in Canada relate to the stats in the United States? And could you talk a little bit about pain episodes related to bipolar? Yeah, I missed that. What did you? What kind of episodes related to bipolar? You were talking about pain episodes. P pain. Yeah, patients have lots of pain syndromes, uh, highly correlated with severity of depression. And with um, with that being a problem, often patients have high levels of pain, and you need to treat both the depression and. Uh, the pain syndromes and acetyl L carnitine is one of those things that can do both. Gabapentin also is useful in treating uh, pain and anxiety, even though it's not a good anti-manic episode. I mean, anti-manic drug. Dr. Post? Yeah. I find, hi, this is Julie Fast. This is great info, thank you. Um, I find that NAC, L-carotene, and the other any or the amino acids cause mania. And without a label on them to say, hey, if you're going to try these, you have to look for signs of mania, I find that they cause too much mania. What are your thoughts on that? Wow. Are you trying them as monotherapy or on top of? It's not only, it's not only for me. It's just it's in my research and with the work that I do and NAC just has a tendency to cause mania when yeah. added, even when taking other substances. So how do we protect people who are going to try amino acids and tell them that there is a chance it can cause mania? Yeah, well, I think the main thing is, is um, to treat the bipolar illness, the manias and depressions, as well as you can with the major tools that I've outlined, lithium, the anticonvulsants and the atypicals, and if one does that, and then add the and add, then and then then you can I add these okay. other things on top. And I think it's very unlikely. Actually, I haven't ever seen these uh, these manias because I put these things in on top of uh, the other ones, and I'm finding that well, people I'm finding that a people good, are looking for natural ways. And so they'll try the NAC without adding lithium or an atypical antipsychotic to it and think that they can just take the NAC. Yeah, well, there's no, there's no data that that's going to actually be that helpful. And as you're, as you're saying, it, you know, it could be counterproductive too. So the, you know, there are multiple natural substances can be added in folic acid vitamin d3 as well that can be helpful in addition to nac and acetyl l carnitine so you can emphasize that you're not kicking out national uh, uh, natural substances but you're using them to augment the, the the big guys sounds good thank you thank you very much yeah. Dr. Post, um, it's Chris Newton. Can I just expand, not expand on that? I've actually just started in AC uh, four days ago because um, uh, just to help me get out of my bipolar depression. It's the first time I've done it, only on a low dose, 500 milligrams, but I definitely have experienced agitation within a couple of hours of starting it. So I'm yeah. sort of like, not convinced I want to keep going down that path. You know, I might give it a week to see if the pattern establishes gets worse, but it's definitely something I'm experiencing as well. Yeah, well, every once in a while, somebody has side effects to things that don't happen that frequently. So yeah. if you're really sensitive to that, um, maybe that's something you can avoid and go to uh, go to other things. But the other thing with NSG is that it actually takes a long time to work. It takes six to eight weeks to kick in because you have to grow transporters in your brain that pull the glutamate out of the synapse. And too much glutamate makes the nerves fire too fast, and that gives you depression and anxiety. So don't expect anything from NAC until weeks later. NAC, for example, is one of the best things for people who pull their hair out, trichotillomania.
But in those studies, it also took six to eight weeks before it broke away from placebo. So you might try to give yourself um, another test or two as to whether this is really causing your agitation or not. If it is, then I would quit. If you get tolerant to that, um, then maybe you can go forward. Thanks. The other thing you mentioned was that there was um, uh, not really a place for antidepressants in um, bipolar management. Um, the Royal Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists have actually just uh, put out their new guideline. And within that, they said that mood switches from antidepressants are uncommon, they're, um, they're rare. Um, and they're actually given steps where they can actually say that if, as long as you're protected by a mood stabiliser, that um, we can go back and look at the consumer and say, if it's only a mild switch, it's okay. And as a consumer, I got to tell you, mild switches, they're the ones that still take your career, your friends, your finances, um, the important stuff off you. And I'm really concerned about that language being given to psychiatrists. Yeah, the problem is that if somebody is actually on an antidepressant with a mood stabilizer and they're doing well, I, I leave that alone. And that's my overall philosophy. If things are going well, don't touch it. And if things are not going well, then get in there and revise it. So there's about 10, 15% of people who do do well on an antidepressant, but that's not a whole lot. We gave antidepressants to 500 people in our network and very few of them had a good long-term response to antidepressants, but there were a few who did and those seemed to do well if we left the antidepressant in. So that's why there's this ambiguity in the literature. Uh, I tried to avoid them as long as possible, but not absolutely, sometimes it's useful to come in with an antidepressant. The other thing for people who are overweight, uh, bupropion or Welbutrin is the antidepressant that's least likely to switch you into mania. And if you add an opiate antagonist like naltrexone to that, it gives you good, uh, good help with losing weight. Uh, there's actually a an FDA approved drug out there called Contrave that has Welbutrin and Naltrexone in it. Uh, but you can also fashion it um, separately as well. So sometimes an antidepressant uh, can be helpful. Can I ask something? Is this Janet from the Philippines? What? Good, good evening, Doc. This is Janet from the Philippines. Can I ask something? I am bipolar. I am bipolar disorder type one, and now a doctor told me that I have a comorbid illness, so-called schizophrenia. I she gave me a medication like clozapine, and it makes me dizzy for how many? You know, and I am is my question is is. Sit. Ah, what's the wait? Wait for a while, doc. I I am nervous. Um, this um, this it's okay, Janet. It's okay. It's okay. So, doc, is this thing applicable for schizophrenic patients? Yeah, clozapine is one of the best anti-psychotic drugs. One of the best anti-atypical drugs for both mania and schizophrenia. We often go to it when other things don't work. There's many other very good atypical, yeah, no. but- um, Cysteine no. Cysteine. What? Cysteine. C -Y -S -T -I -E -N -E -N. I have language barrier because I am not speaking English in English. Um, it is the so-called system. I don't really know that kind of drug. Is it okay for bipolar and schizophrenia patients? Yeah, yeah. It's actually got placebo-controlled data that N-acetylcysteine helps both bipolar patients and schizophrenic patients. It does both. Uh, a guy named Mike Burke wrote about this. 
So you can use that as an adjunct. Thank you very much. Dr. Post, may I ask a question? Yeah, please. Um, I'm wondering if you speak a little bit about um, how bipolar may present and interact with a young child who is on the spectrum. Um, yeah, the, the, two, the two can co-occur. And the key thing is if somebody's on the spectrum or has ADHD, you have to look for the things that are not these other syndromes, but are more likely related to bipolar. So very young kids are things to look out for if they have ADHD or the spectrum is decreased need for sleep. They're up all night, running around, energetic. They, they also are much more irritable than um, kids with ADHD. And if they get into depression, anxiety, suicidal thinking, then you got to think about maybe it being bipolar. The same thing if, if a young kid is propositioning her, his school teacher for, for sexual favors, that's, that's almost always bipolar disorder and not ADHD. Um, and then if somebody has hallucinations and delusions, that's almost always bipolar uh, and not any of those other things. And the same kinds of things you want to look at mood mood elevation out of context if somebody's laughing and telling jokes in church um you know that doesn't go along with adhd or autism spectrum disorder so you you need to look at the things that are more suggestive of the, these comorbidities with bipolar and, and not just look at the ADHD. Too often people, and, and very young kids, very young kids, ADHD. It won't, so I'm gonna go get the headphones as high as it goes. What? Too often in very young kids, bipolar and ADHD go together. And there you need to mood stabilize the kid before the stimulants. Okay. I understand. Um, and then in terms of therapy with those two um, diagnoses, how can you piece apart what should be done? Because it's almost like a, uh, a snowball effect or they're building on each other, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's where, that's where intensive family work can be helpful, where you try to, you try to, uh, increase communication among the family members, keep the emotion tone down low, enhance really good uh, ways of, of dealing with stressors that uh, people in the family can agree upon. And th that kind of family work uh, should really be put in there for anyone with these uh, prodromal symptoms that won't that won't do enough for kids with ADHD uh, they're going to need some ADHD meds but those ADHD meds need to be on top of the mood stabilizers if they've got comorbid bipolar yeah well I was actually speaking about be, um, autism and bipolar disorder um, I, yeah, wonder yeah. If, I wonder if I don't know how to phrase my question. Um, I guess, I'm sorry, lost my thought. Yeah, well, with the autism, all kinds of ways of trying to support the child so socially and see what you can do to enhance communication. But that it turns out the N-acetylcysteine is a good thing for autism that they did studies. There's two positive placebo controlled studies of N-acetylcysteine 
It needs to go up to 2,700 milligrams a day, but it both worked as monotherapy in autistic kids about irritability and aggression, and it also worked as an adjunct to an atypical. So that could be added into whatever other support and psychotherapeutic uh, approaches that you're using. Okay, thank you very much for your information. I appreciate it. Sure. Dr. Post, um, I have a question about disassociation um, with somebody that's on lithium for a long term. Is that something you see a lot? Um, not, not lithium driven. It could be sort of left over from something like post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, that's where you usually see uh, dissociation that uh, if somebody's had really severe trauma, sometimes people early on learn to kind of almost get out of their body, if you will, to, to try to deal with it. And that's where we see most of the dissociation. If, if somebody is having dissociation, I don't think it's related to the lithium. I think it's more related to under treatment of maybe uh, a post-traumatic stress disorder like syndrome. And that often requires uh, additional treatment with the anticonvulsants. Uh, often that dissociation can be um, treated with a combination of anticonvulsants and atypicals along with the lithium. Thank you. Hi, my, Dr. Post? Yeah. Hey, this, this, this is John over in Hawaii. I have a question for you about gabapentin. In, yeah. in August, oh, I'm sorry, in, in October of 2018, I went into a really heavy duty chronic, I don't know what you call it, a manic episode. And I've been manic my entire life. But in May of 2018, I went really, really overboard manic. I, I was diagnosed in 2001 by a psychiatrist repeatedly in Reno, Nevada after seven stays in a mental hospital where I checked in for myself for alcohol abuse. Anyway, to get back to the point, I'm an alcoholic. I've been one since I was a little kid. I've been manic since I was a little kid and, that, and I'm almost 70. I'll be 70 in February. Uh, the gabapentin was prescribed to me in October of 2018. And when I went into the hospital here in Hilo on May 3rd of 2018, I was in a really heavy duty manic episode and they almost hospitalized me, but they told me to go home. And I, I've been dealing with that ever since. And I, I have fought it by abusing alcohol and uh, to, to calm down the mania. Obviously I was self-medicating and only got out of control at more than once. There's nothing new for me. Anyway, they, they prescribed a, a, a neurologist, prescribed the gabapentin to me in October of 2018, and he knew full well I was manic as hell when I went into his office. He said so. He said, why are you talking so fast and acting so crazy? I said, I, I'm manic. And he goes, oh, okay. So he dealt with that. And I said, so he said, do you want to try gabapentin? Because it was being prescribed for peripheral neuropathy in my feet and my hands, which is really bad. And now I, can, I can't feel my hands or my feet just tingling chronic pain. So I was, I took, he, he prescribed originally two 300 milligram tab, I'm sorry, one 300 milligram tablet in a capsule in the morning and two 300 milligram tablets just before bed of the gabapentin every day. <clears throat> so I took that the first night I took it right after I got out of his office, I felt immediate relief. I had restless leg syndrome and a really bad neuropathy and all of a sudden it stopped and I thought, oh. It worked great, but he told me before I went home, he said, it's probably going to take a while to start working. So it was, I, I thought it was working. It was not. And yeah, so well, that's, the, that's the deal. As I mentioned, gabapentin is, is a useful drug like topiramate. Both of those can uh, decrease alcohol consumption, but neither of them are good anti-manic agents. A drug like Depakote can help you avoid uh, alcohol, and it is a good anti-manic. So you need to get a better anti-manic regimen 
because gabapentin is not going to do it. However, gabapentin does help with pain. The other thing is that the acetyl L-carnitine that you can buy from a drugstore is good for peripheral neuropathy and pain. It's not anti-manic either, but it could help in that uh, territory. But the key thing for you is see whatever you can do to try to cut down the alcohol intake um, and get a better anti-manic regimen because gabapentin ain't going to do it. Hi, Dr. Dr. Post. Yeah. Could you speak about the what you've seen in regards to head injury or head trauma um, kind of beginning somebody's bipolar journey? Have you seen uh, that a lot? It, it can happen. It's in the literature as something that can uh, trigger these episodes. It's not, it's not that common, but it certainly can happen. Um, the uh, one of the things that triggers bipolar disorder uh, at a pretty high rate is multiple sclerosis with its white matter abnormalities and bipolar patients also have white matter tract abnormalities. But if somebody has head trauma that can uh, not only cause the traumatic injury, but it can cause inflammation around it. And we think that some depression and mania is associated with increased inflammation. So it depends on where the head trauma area is and whether or not it does some of these other bad stream uh, down, bleh, some of these other downstream bad things like inflammation, yeah. If they have bipolar, do you recommend that they get like scans to track the, like you said, the white matter or what's happening in the brain? Um, like historically, or how often do you recommend that? Or is that recommended to follow? It's, it's not that highly recommended, although almost all the studies show that there are white matter tract abnormalities in people with bipolar disorder, even without head trauma. And it even is white matter abnormalities in uh, children with bipolar disorder. One of the things that you can do is lithium because lithium helps uh, increase white matter and increase gray matter. And uh, that has neuroprotective effects. So lithium uh, can, can hopefully uh, improve some of the white matter abnormalities. Dr. Post, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned about N-acetyl was it N-acetylcysteine, I think? Yeah, N-A-C, yeah. N-acetylcysteine, yeah. Yeah, what's the good, because my brother has schizo and, and depression. He's taking something for the, he's taking the olanzapine and I forgot what his antidepressant. Is it okay to, to, to buy the over-the-counter drug, the N-acetylcysteine for my brother? Yeah, it tends to go well with any of these other major psychiatric drugs. I, I've never yeah. seen a really bad interaction with that. Yeah. Uh, what's a good dosage for, for, for that? Uh, for, for most of the things with bad habits, it's uh, one twice a day for a week and then two pills in the morning and two at night. Um, for a few things, like for the autistic kids, it needs to be more than that, and for smoking cessation, more than that, 2,500 milligrams. So uh, two 500 milligram capsules in the morning, two at night is a typical dose for most things, but sometimes you need two in the morning, three at night. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you for Dr. that. Dr. Post? Yeah. This is Melinda Kinney from um, California. I, I had a question. My son has been re, did, was diagnosed at age 18 with bipolar disorder when he went away to college. And he also uses THC on a regular basis, pretty high concentrations. We had things kind of a contr under control, but not a great life, just like kind of functioning. And then just recently he started having nightly panic attacks that 
are very extreme. And if it wasn't COVID and there was ER, we would, it wasn't full, we'd probably be going to the hospital, but we've been managing them ourselves. And I was just curious if that could be related to THC. I mean, we're just trying to figure them out because this is a new thing. And then he also has fits of rage that come out of nowhere. And that's what's, that was the first thing we noticed that was a little bit strange, but then this panic attack is a new thing and it's nightly and they're really excruciating. And is that yeah, associated yeah. with bipolar? So here's, here's the story that um, if you, if somebody's doing a lot of uh, pot, a lot of THC, that tends to be associated with more problems with depression, anxiety, and the, even the precipitation of some psychosis. So you want to do everything you can to try to get somebody to back off and use less. And acetylcysteine can help adolescents use less marijuana, but you need to be more aggressive about the treatment of his, his nighttime panic attacks. Um, something, something like, uh, like Depakote at night uh, can help with... Uh, anxiety pretty pretty well and other things you got to get the doctor to keep on working on the nighttime panic attacks until they go away dr post yeah <laughs> um i recently heard that the mthfr gene mutation is prevalent in bipolar disorder and i take methylfolate have you heard anything about that study Oh yeah, the um, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase deficiency is the full name for that MTHFR syndrome. And if you have that gene, it means there's slow conversion of folate uh, to L-methylfolate, which needs to be the active ingredient. So if you have that okay. gene, if you have the gene marker, you need okay. L-methylfolate. You need L-methylfolate. I'm out. Yes, I'm out. And that's pretty common in the general population. My wife and daughter both have that one, so they're, they're both on L-methylfolate. Dr. President, Dr. Post, would you repeat that, on? please? I didn't hear you with the background noise. Oh. I'm sorry, what? Would you repeat what you were talking about? Uh, with the methylfolate, I didn't hear you with the background noise. Yeah, if if people who aren't talking can mute, then maybe that'll help. The um, what I was saying is that the, is about fifteen to twenty five percent of the of the population that has a slow folate metabolism that you can measure it with these gene tests, and if you have that folic acid is not good enough and you need L-methylfolate in, in order to get around the, the slow folate metabolism blockade. So if you have that marker, you definitely need L-methylfolate. And if you wanna be sure, if you don't have the gene marker and you wanna be sure you have a good folate effect, then you can take L-methylfolate even if you don't have that marker because it's four times more potent than folate itself. And what is your recommended dose of the L-methylfolate? If, if you can afford it, uh, 15 milligrams uh, or just one or two are pretty good because that's four times more potent than regular folate. I think Christina had a question. Thank you, Katrin. Um, I actually, I have three questions, two of them relatively simple. Um, the big one I wanted to ask is, can you describe for me uh, a little bit of what it looks like to be diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder? Like what are, the, what are things that are looked for that make someone schizoaffective? Yeah, so, the thing is that lots of times with bipolar illness, you can have psychotic components to either the manias or the depressions, um, hallucinations, delusions that go with the episodes. When the episodes are treated and go away, if the hallucinations, delusions go away too, that means you have just regular bipolar. If in fact, 
the episodes of mania and depression go away and you still have problems with psychotic thinking, hallucinations, delusions, that kind of thing in between episodes, that tends to be associated with the diagnosis of schizoaffective. So it just means that there's some difficult psychotic components that continue in the interval between episodes. Okay, and then um, my other two questions were, um, how common is it for lithium to affect the thyroid? Um, pretty common, about 15% of people who uh, on lithium will get low thyroid, but if they do, it's easy to treat. You just get thyroid hormone replacement. And some people recommend adding thyroid hormone T3, even with normal thyroid levels, because that can enhance antidepressant effects and, and cognitive functioning on lithium. So adding some thyroid in there uh, can even be a good thing, even if you don't have low thyroid values. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, what, do you, what would you say are the best medications prescribed for mixed episodes? So if you're literally manic and depressed kind of simultaneously and uh, bouncing back and forth between the two? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, often a combination of things, and this is one area where the antidepressants tend to make things worse. So mm -hmm. I, I would not use those and I would use an, an atypical, an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer and uh, lithium as well. And one of the good ones is triple L therapy, meaning lithium, lamotrigine, and lamictal. Those three tend to have good effects on both the manic side and the antidepressant side, including people who have mixed episodes. Dr. Post? Yeah. You said um, lithium, lamotrigine, and lamictal. Did you mean something else? What did I say? Lithium, lamotrigine, and lamictal. You said lamictal twice. Lithium, latuda. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, LLL. I need another cup of coffee. Lithium, <laughs> latuda, and lamotrigine. That's very good for covering both the manic and the depressive side and can handle some mixed episodes pretty well. But most of the atypicals are pretty good for mixed episodes as well. Is there some that substitute for lamotrigine if you have um, the bad reaction to the rash? Um, yeah, you could you could use you could use Depakote because it's very good for depression, anxiety, mixed episodes on top of uh, the other ones. Uh, and that's very unlikely to give you a rash. If you have a rash on Lamotrigine, you may be more likely to get it on carbamazepine, but oxcarbazepine or trileptal is less likely to give you a rash. So that could be an agent to try as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, Hi, my name's Yvonne. Um, I just have a quick question about um, tracking the moods of children. I have bipolar one with psychotic features. I wasn't diagnosed until I was 34 years old, um, but I know I had early signs of it as a child. And I'm wondering, my children don't seem to have anything like what I was like as a kid, but should I still just track them to be vigilant because I'd like to be vigilant or should I wait until like, I don't know, they start to express some kind of anxiety, depression symptoms before I do a weekly mood tracker for them? Yeah. Um, if they're not showing any signs of having problems, you, you, you might you might delay doing that, but if they did start, then if you track it and bring it to a doc, then it's easier to decide whether they have something that's significant and needs treatment or not. But okay. if they don't have any problems now, probably not worth your bothering. 
Okay, thanks. The other thing is that you had a, a late life onset of your bipolar disorder, mm -hmm. and that's actually helpful in uh, in distinguishing who gets childhood or not. Because if okay. some, if a parent has early onset bipolar disorder themselves, then if the kids are going to get it, it's more likely also early onset. So with your okay. having late onset, uh, they may not get it at all. That would be nice. Yeah, I, I have a family history and those all seem to be diagnosed as adult. I just wonder if um, my mood had been tracked as a child, if it could have like, if it would have been caught sooner, like if I'd maybe been um, having some mania prior to my huge psychotic break, you know, like it, it got, it just got really bad at us at that age yeah, before yeah. I was present prior. We, we missed the diagnosis early on in a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. So it's good that you eventually did get diagnosed. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Um, does all of this apply to cyclothymia as well, or does that need to be treated differently since the episodes um, might be smaller? Yeah, good question. Um, some of it does uh, apply, but usually the levels of depression are less severe and the uh, Manias are just little hypomanias, also less severe, more chronic for both. And one of the things that happens with uh, cyclothymia is that sometimes people respond to lower doses of the same things like, uh, uh, like, like Depakote, Lamotrigine, other things like that. You might not need to push the doses high to get after it. Um, but the key thing is dysfunction. If, 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 if the severity of the depressions and the highs are enough to make it difficult to function, um, then, then I would definitely be thinking about uh, treating it often in the same kind of way that we've been talking about. <clears throat> Dr. Post, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in reference to uh, bipolar one and bipolar two, uh, my daughter was just recently diagnosed at age 18 with bipolar two. Um, I do believe she probably had it as early as age 13, but the, none of the doctors, nurse practitioners, no one caught it. So <clears throat> she had a pretty big episode uh, this summer of hypomania. And so that's what precipitated the diagnosis. Do you feel that the um, the cognitive decline between bipolar one and two are similar, if not treated early enough? I mean, she did very well in high school, um, you know, with her grades. Um, so that I wanted to ask about, and then also uh, a lot of breakthrough anxiety, even on the Lamotrigine, two hundred milligrams. Yeah. Um... Full-blown mania seems to have more cognitive dysfunction associated with it than, than more minor hypomanias. Okay. Depression, depression can have big time cognitive dysfunction with it too, and even anxiety can mess up um, cognitive functioning. So the uh, if she, she's struggling with anxiety on top of the Lamotrigine, uh, mm -hmm. That typically indicates that uh, uh, she needs more, more help for the Lamotrigine, if you will. Possibly an atypical like Latuda mm -hmm. uh, or the N-acetylcysteine helps with depression and anxiety, although it takes a long time. Uh, Gabapentin can help with anxiety a little bit, even though it's not anti-manic. So I would... I would think about all the different ways that you could try to get that anxiety under control because that that can that can really be problematic, particularly for a youngster. Yeah, she's only getting she's just treating her currently with Buspar. 
with buspar. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's not the world's best anxiolytic. So if right. that's not doing the job, you might try going elsewhere. Okay. All right. So either the you said gabapentin and uh, and you also said Latuda. Is that an antipsychotic, the Latuda? Latuda, yeah, but it's FDA approved for bipolar depression. Okay. And Does it approved. have a lot of weight gain? No, that's that's okay. why it makes it so good. No weight gain, no metabolic effects, and it's approved for kids uh, 12 to 17 and it, and uh, very few dropouts. Only 2% of people dropped out for any kind of side effects. So it's okay. well tolerated. Thank you so much. Oh, I had a question. Yo. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Hi, um, my daughter at the age of 25, she was diagnosed as, as bipolar one, it came out of nowhere. And she, in six months, she had six episodes where she had to be hospitalized with mania. She finally got on the right doses of medicine. She's taking three different kinds. But um, the only side effect she has now is her legs shake, they bob up and down and she can't stop them. Is there anything that you would recommend to stop the shakiness of the legs? Um, what meds is she on that seem to be causing the shaky legs? Well, I don't know which one it is, but she's on Ciprazitone, um, Devil Pro-X and Clonazepam. Uh. And somebody had recommended her take by Benzotropine. MES, I don't know if she really doesn't want to ha take extra medication. She doesn't really mind the bobby legs, but I'm wondering if maybe there's something over the counter that she could take instead of having more drugs. Um, yeah, you could, you could try, um, you could try that Benzoda, uh, the, um, uh, the Benadryl, sometimes, oh, Benadryl? Uh -huh. sometimes that helps. I'm not sure what in this case, uh, and sometimes a little bit of a benzodiazepine, a long acting one like clonazepam, uh, could help. Uh, a, a few things like that. You sort of have to do a trial and error, but if it's not bothering her, uh, and she finally is stable and not having any more manias, that, that might be pretty good to leave it. Uh-huh, because we did pick up 0.5 milligrams of benztropine, but she was a little hesitant to take it. She's not sure if she wants to. But I don't yeah. know if you well, you could try it out for a little while and see if it helps. If it doesn't, quit it. Right, so there would be like no, no problem in her quitting it if it didn't, nope. being a low dose. Nope, nope. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate your advice. Okay. Dr. Post, might I jump in for one more question? Yeah. Um, so my daughter is 11 years old. She's been experiencing um, significant symptoms of, I'm not sure yet exactly. I have bipolar myself. It manifests Fested, not at her age, but in my late teens, um, as bipolar two, and then um, kind of switched into bipolar one. <clears throat> one of my questions is, like I had said, she's diagnosed as being on the spectrum in terms of autism, and uh, what her psychiatrist has explained to me is that she, well, and I know this, she's constantly irritable. Uh, he's used the word bad reality testing, and she has small moments of psychosis, which she doesn't remember, and you can see on her face. Um, so at this point in time, she has not been diagnosed with bipolar, and part of the reason I wanted to join this conversation was to get your input on that, um, because most recently, um, so she's on a Bilify Lamotrigine and um, I forget the name of the antidepressant, but an antidepressant. Um, so, so I guess, given all of that, what, what would your response be? 
Yeah, the um, Dan acetylcysteine is, is something that has three positive placebo controlled studies in kids with autism, mm -hmm. four to 17. So that might be, so, and, it, and it definitely helped irritability. So that might be something to talk with your doc about doing. It's an over-the-counter thing, but everything we're yeah. talking about should be run by people's docs, of course, before okay. they can do anything. Um, but that that could help with irritability. Um, yeah. If you were to hazard a guess, um, based on especially the bad reality testing and um, there's significant uh, outbursts of violence. Um, and then those moments of psychosis which um, come in those um, outbursts of violence. If you, as a um, professional who does not actually know my child, would you, given all that information, hasten to guess that she does have bipolar disorder? Um. Does she have periods of mood elevation and euphoria, manic kinds of activation, or just the irritability and violence? Um, I'm not sure about manic activation, but she can kind of like go into the zone where she does not want to be interrupted, where she's like very focused, which is what complicates um, diagnosis because that's something that happens with autistic children as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't sound like it's bipolar at this point, but just like she's got autistic spectrum, I would think that it's sort of like bipolar-like spectrum. Not yet bipolar, but I'd sort of watch out for it. And if the irritability and violence are, you know, particularly getting her into difficulties, I would go ahead and treat it as if it were bipolar. Okay, so would that mean that you would take her off that antidepressant? Because I've worried that about that for a bit. Um, it might, yeah, you, you might talk with a doc about doing that and and uh, adding something else in addition and and maybe also including the anacetylcysteine but well, sometimes said, sometimes the antidepressants can disinhibit kids so uh, that yeah that could be right she takes um so she takes lamictal um as well as abilify along with um, the antidepressant. So she has like a cocktail going on. Um, yeah, so you might want to get rid of the antidepressant and see if that decreases her irritability and aggression because that can sometimes disinhibit kids. Okay. And then um, are there any, any signs that I should be looking for? Again, she's 11 years old. I have bipolar disorder, there's significant family history. So I've been watching for a while. She is very, very clearly autistic. Um, that's not questionable. Is there anything I should be watching out for other than like complete signs of mania? The, the thing that worries me most is periods of psychosis, um, as far as I've read, are not associated with autism. Yeah, the little breakthrough psychosis it tends to be more with bipolar, that's for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm thinking about treating her more as if she were bipolar, even if she isn't, might be a good thing for you and her doctor, okay. too. And the anacetylcysteine could help both of those areas, too, both the autism and the irritability. Thank you so much for your sage advice. I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Dr. Post. Uh, yo. I am on the vagus nerve stimulator. Have you heard any research about that with bipolar and depression? Yeah. Is the, the, the key question is how long have you been on it and how much is it helping? 
I have now been on it for about six to eight weeks um, for my migraines and for my depression and anxiety and for stomach issues. And I can stop a migraine. It's amazing for that. Um, I have recently started on Lamotrigine. So I, with that and the vagus nerve stimulator, I do notice a big difference with my anxiety. Oh, that's great. Good start. Because one of the things with the vagus nerve stimulator is that it tends to work more the longer you're on it. And a guy named Aronson did a study of how people who were on it for five years did. And there was a very high incidence of very good long-term response. Over 50% of people on the vagus nerve stimulator. And it worked even in some patients who didn't respond to ECT. So it's a definite um, good thing. And with your having some initial success, uh, that, that sounds like a really good start. It's been amazing for migraines. So I'm hoping all the other long-term long effects that I really do feel those. But if anybody can get on it that has migraines, I highly suggest you reach out to your doctor for it. Wow. Where are you getting it, by the way? Um, I go through the Jasmine Medical Center and my neurologist uh, recommended it and got it sent to me. And I'm also getting the um, dream band sent to me. The what? The dream band. What's that? Um, it'll do a, I'll use it at night and it'll do, it'll monitor my brain waves and then um, do little like electrodes during the night while I sleep. Oh my goodness. It sounds like you really got a good start with all kinds of high tech things. Uh, that's great. Now, yeah, where, but, where did you say you're getting this in what town? Um, well, I'm from Holiday, Florida. Yeah. And it's the Jasmine Medical Center. Jasmine? Yes. Yeah. I, okay. And they're based out of Miami. Yeah. And my neurologist is affiliated with USF in Florida. I yeah. live right next to Tampa. All right. Well, it sounds. I'm, also the, I'm the one that also has the MTHFR mutation. Yeah. Well, you definitely need l methylfolate then. <laughs> I've been on that and NAC for many years. Yeah. Okay. Well, keep up. Thank you for all keep of your. Keep up work. all the good, the good stuff. It sounds like you've got super high tech docs there. I have an amazing team of doctors. I'm very fortunate. And thank yeah. you for doing this tonight. Sure. Dr. Kuss, can you speak about long-term usage of lithium? Is it okay? Because if we're starting them when they're teens and they still have a whole life ahead of them, is it okay? Have you seen what that looks like long-term? Yeah, they've done some long-term follow-up studies and it turns out that the, that the key issues with, with kidney problems is, uh, is really in the vast minority. And it usually doesn't start until somebody's been on it for 20 or 30 years. And if it does, it usually doesn't progress to a full-blown problem. And in fact, they've done some studies that people who are on anticonvulsants and not lithium actually have more renal problems than on lithium. So I would definitely monitor the creatinine levels, uh, but not worry too much uh, about the short-term side effects in that regard. The lithium in kids, there's two naturalistic studies, <coughs> one from St. Louis and one from the Pittsburgh group that said that kids with bipolar disorder who were on lithium did much better than on other regimens. They had less depression, less suicide, less all sorts of stuff. So. Think about lithium even in the younger kids. We don't use it enough in adults, and I think it needs to be used in, in kids a fair bit, and particularly since it's one of the things that can um, help with some of these brain changes. It seems to um, help reverse white matter abnormalities, and it increases the volume of one's hippocampus. So it's actually doing some good things. Laura, I think you had a question. I do have a question. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon indeed. 
Uh, hi, um, my name is Enrique Corolla. I'm from Mexico and I have bipolar disorder one with uh, mixed features and um, it's called um, mixed episodes as well and rapid cycling, sorry. And I've been medicated since I was 15. But my question is not about myself. It's about my brother. You know, now on these days, doctors decide to prescribe Ritalin to every child who it's uh, just misbehaving at school and uh, ADHD is trending now apparently and the meth uh, grim. I do, I do know that because I work at the clinic. Um, and now I'm training my brother with uh, magnesium valproate and he seems to be doing very well. However, my mom doesn't want to medicate him. So um, clearly bipolar disorder runs in my family like water. Uh, so I'm not very sure if he has bipolar or or not because uh, we believe there's no there isn't there isn't a psychiatrist or psychologist nearby and my mom she's not very since I since I was diagnosed I believe that my mom she doesn't want to do so much with um, medicine anymore because I've been over medicated so um, he's getting treatment with magnesium valproate and. He was doing okay, but then my mom decided to, to quit it without any um, recommendation from any doctor or asking me uh, in, in a given case. So what would you recommend in the behavioral way instead if, of using when, medicine? What, when your mom quit the, the Valproate, the Depakote, did he start getting worse again? Yes, he did. And yeah, well, then, then you got to make the case with her that, that he's had an on off on off trial that, that nails down the fact that, you know, whatever his diagnosis is, that he's doing better on Depakote and he needs to be on it again. I would, I would take it in that direction. Is he also on stimulants for his ADHD? Uh, well, um, I work with uh, in the in a side work. I'm a math student. I forgot to mention it, and uh, he, he was getting prescribed extended release uh, Ritalin or or Concerta, and he was prescribed take it as a half pill in the morning and half at night by some random doctor, and. Uh, I told her to quit it because obviously it's not HDHD. There, he's oh, having, so if he's I, not ADHD, then don't do it. So I would do everything I can to convince your mother that you know he was better on it and worse off. He should be on it. Yes, I'm on Depakote indeed, and and lithium as well. Yeah, and it has worn work at wonders for me, except for the acne. <laughs> However, I'm yeah. more stable now. And I wish that that my mom uh, can can uh, take your advice. Actually, I'm recording this, and I'm going to send her because I want her to understand the importance of this. Uh, because I don't want to escalate it as it happened to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you're recording this, what I can say to your mom is, you know, if something's really working. You should stick with it, and particularly if it's working, and then you then you confirm it was working because somebody relapses off of it. It would be good to get them back on it, and um, not not to have any preconceived notions about medications and stuff. Particularly with you, if you're doing well on on that and lithium, you know that's that's a that's a great sign, and maybe. Maybe your brother needs to be staying back on his uh, Depico. By the way, you you said that you were, I don't know if you can see that. You see, it says Mexico on my- Yes, on my, oh. I got that five years ago. They put it, 
on my hand when I visited Mexico, such a wonderful place. And I was waiting for it to fall off, but it hasn't yet in five years. <laughs> well, we have a house at Sonora, Mexico. It's below Arizona. Yeah. And you're welcome to come here anytime. Okay, so it's uh, 7.30. If anybody has some pressing questions, we'll take a few more. And then Thank we- I have one question, please. I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. What? Um, my name is Katie. I have a question about lithium. My name is Katie. Uh, lithium. Let's take the lithium question first. Yeah. Um, I have a question about the side effects from lithium, and I'm not talking about kidney side effects. On, um, I talk about cognition, and I had big problems with balance. I, I could not drive with a bicycle. Uh, couldn't stand and put my jeans on and so uh, could you say something to that yeah if uh if you're getting those side effects from lithium one of the best things to do is to lower the dose some and see if you can get away with it without having more symptoms if you lower the dose the side effects go away but you get more symptoms then you need to augment lithium with uh, something else to make up for the rest of the lithium side effects, but people can get- I had a very, very, very low doses. It was um, just enough to keep me alive, but this was not enough to keep my symptoms away. But I really, I anyway had very bad uh, side effects. Is that not so oft? So um, I had to stop because of the side effects. Oh, okay, well, then then you need to go to some of the other options to try to get things under better control. Okay, thank you. Dr. 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 Post, I have a question. For many years, misdiagnosed with major medical depression and given first the earlier tricyclic antipsychotics, which made me psychotic and... Uh, stop taking them eventually uh I, I didn't have problems for a while after i got married and had a child and then eventually got depressed again and was given ssris which after five years of trying different ssris uh triggered me into mania and then i was diagnosed for the first time with bipolar disorder however I don't have a, a typical bipolar one. It doesn't seem typical. Uh, I don't get depressed. Um, I get manic. That's my, I get hypomanic frequently and it's always euphoric hypomania. And um, it only went into depression after my first untreated episode and after a second one. And it's really depression over shame at my behavior, which of course at the time I thought was perfectly reasonable and found out later, oh no, that wasn't. Uh, so that was depressing, but I haven't gone into, I've never had a depression that's come out of nowhere. I've never had any symptoms that were not uh, brought on by usually a perfect storm of triggers, um, like death in a family, traveling, divorce, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, from what you're saying, you shouldn't be on those SSRI antidepressants. They trigger oh, no, 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 Yeah, no, so stay, no. away, I, stay away from them. No, I know that. And- but What are you asking? Going, what are you asking then? Well, I'm asking what I should be on or if I should reconsider my diagnosis because I had horrible reactions to every antipsychotic med um uh tongue thrust um i i, I had life threatening um side effects and had to go to er so i can't take um antipsychotics and what i was taking and lithium didn't work well for me either so i was on lamictal for 18 years however lamictal is really more for depression than mania and I had breakthrough mania, manic episodes every five years. So uh, we could never see that, that Lamictal had done any good for me whatsoever. 
Uh, and so my doctor and I discontinued it last spring. Um, I still, right now, I've been having a hypomanic episode. Um, I've come down a lot, but it's lasted for six, over six months. I have severe ADHD, and we began uh, treating it with, I, I've tried four different um, ADHD yeah. medications. Well, you, need, you need to be on some uh, some things for your hypomania and, and mania that, uh, you know, some, the, some of the anticonvulsants that are better for mania, like uh, like Depakote or carbamazepine. Um, I, I tried I tried okay. uh, trileptal the um, yeah some something carb carb it's it's something by oxcarbazamine yeah uh, right but I had a very bad reaction to that as well okay so you need to continue looking for something that works that doesn't cause you bad side effects maybe try Depakote or something like that. Okay, I just oh, wasn't question. willing. I didn't want to try any other antipsychotic medication. It's not an antipsychotic. It's, not. it's anti -convulsant. So you think that and would be safe some, to try? There's some new antipsychotics that are pretty well tolerated too. So you might review your whole story, uh, do a mood chart of what your six months of hypomania looks like, and tell the doc, "Hey, this is no good. We need to get after it." Okay. That's okay. what you do. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Post for tonight. Uh, Dr. Post? Yeah. One last question. Okay. Um, I have a question about rapid cycling. What about rapid cycling? What's your take on rapid cycling? Some people, I have ultra D and rapid, rapid cycling. Um, I, um, you're breaking up if you have ultradian rapid cycling that means you have cycles within a single 24-hour period if you have that talk to your doc about uh, uh, nemotapine a calcium channel blocker that works well in ultradian cycling um, you may need more than the usual kinds of things for that fast cycling. Sometimes lithium works, but sometimes it doesn't. And lithium plus nemotapine are good. And then you might need um, an atypical as well. What's the last one? Yeah. Um, so I was, I, I, my question is related to mixed episodes and it's actually regarding myself and not my child. Um, I, I began with severe depression around the age of seven, and that's how it presented. I went through unrecognized periods of hypomania, but mostly suffering from quite severe um, depression um, until I reached um, adult age and, and tried different uh, um, uh, antidepressants. And then there was a huge trigger after my children were born. Um, and, and I've experienced uh, one full manic episode. Um, and mostly since then, there's been mixed episodes, which occur probably every three to five months. Um, I currently take omeprazole, lamictal, clonopin, and prazosin. Um, I you, guess- You uh, couldn't take what? I'm sorry? You couldn't take what? I missed the- what you said, you couldn't take what? Currently take omeprazole, lamictal, clonopin, prazosin, and gabapentin. And I feel uh, fairly stable, except for the fact that they keep coming back. And, and kind of what you had said about triggers, um, many of my children are uh, have disabilities, so I, uh, I can't avoid triggers. Um, yeah. So if they keep on recurring, you should you should increase the complexity of your meds with something to try to prevent them from from occurring. And they, uh, at maybe adding lithium or an atypical antipsychotic would help. I guess that was the underlying question I had: is that because I don't, I've only had one full manic episode. Um, 
if lithium would be a good option for me because my psychiatrist hasn't presented that to me and I do, do feel comfortable with her. Um, yeah, talk more about lithium and, and, and an atypical, uh, particularly the atypicals for mixed episodes um, may be the most helpful thing. Yeah, I just haven't been able to tolerate them well, but I will bring that up again. And um, it, it's nice to hear that I might be a candidate for um, lithium based on all that you have presented before. And I appreciate so much your time. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Okay, so, guys, thanks, Dr. Post. Thank you so thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so you very much. much. Have a nice night. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Post. Much. And thank, thank you. you guys for all these good thank questions. Uh, really, you. really on target. Take care and good luck thank with you. this. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 That was wow. Thank you. Hmm.